Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. back and I'm glad to be back. The last time we put out a podcast, it was one of our sacred marriage segments. We decided to take uh, a break and uh, in the interim, we've come up with uh, something of a new plan that I thought I would mention. Uh, Instead of putting out uh, essentially two segments five times a day, I'm going to put out oh five or six segments once a week. Uh, so we're going to have a weekly podcast and instead of, uh, oh, by the way, the other four days of the week at rcsproljr.com, I'll have fresh, uh, blog pieces. So four blog pieces and a podcast every week and maybe, uh, as well, uh, our, our weekly Bible study on Mondays. But one other change is instead of having my precious wife as a guest on a sacred marriage segment every other week, we're going to have her on every week. So, sweetheart, I'm so glad to have you here. I'm so glad to be here. And uh, so looking forward uh, as we move forward. And when we left off, we were in First um, Peter uh, chapter 3, and we spent a fair amount of time talking about modesty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and today I'd like for us to move on to another uh, passage that I, I, I might suggest is uh, so weird to our ears that you might not even consider it controversial. It's so weird. We just sort of block it out and act like it's not there. Uh, And this is Peter's admonition, uh, or rather praise, of Sarah for calling her husband Lord. Mm. Peter then goes on to encourage the uh, wives who are receiving this letter to do much the same thing. And I, I tell you, you, obviously, you know, that you probably never once in all of your life, having been a Christian from a young age, you've never once heard anyone encourage any wife to call her husband Lord. I have. You have? I have very much. Well, so. let, me, let me hear about it. Well, I have done many studies, especially like The Excellent Wife that Martha Peace had put out years ago. Oh, yeah, she's great. It is. And she taught on submission. That was in my 20s, meaning that that word was to line up under. It's a militant term. It's a protective term. And um, there are women boldly willing to speak out without the fear of rejection um, in terms of submission, so well, I have heard it. I, you've heard submission, sweetheart. But have you? Did even I wouldn't as to much call as I, you Lord. I, yeah, yes, but usually it's respect, in a joke. Yes, exactly. It's like you know, you say it, Lord. I'm not suggesting that there aren't people out there teaching wives to submit to their husbands. There are, and I'm, and Martha Peace is one of them. Yeah. And she's a wonderful one. But what what I'm suggesting is, is Lord. yeah, this calling him Lord. Just it. We sort of toss that into mm-hmm. the uh, greet them with a holy kiss category mm-hmm. it's something that is unless they have covid yeah <laughs> uh something that is outside uh mm-hmm. what is allowable or or, or even considered it, it must be cultural surely mm-hmm. we're not supposed to do this however it's interesting to note is it not that uh one peter is in the midst of instructing wives on the meaning of what it means to be submissive to their husbands And he's citing an example that at the time that he gives it is probably about 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And so he's not saying, well, hey, you know, in our day, this is one of the ways that wives demonstrate their submission. They call their husbands Lord. So you Christian wives, I want you to do that too. No, he goes back 2,000 years and says, this is what you should be like. So why don't we? Why, why don't wives call their husbands Lord? Do you think it's because uh, they don't see them that way and therefore they really aren't embracing this teaching on submission? Or do you think it's something else? Hmm. 
culturally, it's probably just not something that we are used to seeing without abuse. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think that we don't know that Sarah called Abraham Lord every single day. That's true. We don't know the context in which she called him Lord, but it seemed as though what she did was she honored her husband by doing what he asked her to do. Case in point, here, go and be with that leader over there because they're going to take all my stuff and harm me. Yes. And she did it. She did. And then God stopped that. And so she honored her husband even to, uh, well, a frightening position for herself. So what you're saying is... uh... Really, you're saying this language uh, of Peter's of calling your husband Lord is more connected to the uh, the the substance of the thing, which is submission. And so, for instance, when Sarah submitted to Abraham, even in this situation where he's really doing wrong, he was, yeah, uh, and being kind of selfish. Mm-hmm. Uh, nevertheless, he's saying this is a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it's almost as if Peter's saying. Uh, it be like Sarah who demonstrated her recognition of uh, Abraham as her Lord. Right, because she he put her in harm's way. Yes, he did. No out of his that. fear. Yeah. He and was... she still honored him. Yeah. We, we don't know what she was thinking or feeling, but she trusted him. And trusted the, the God Lord. above him, yeah. yes, that he would take care of And this. he did. And this is one of the reasons, you know, when I speak on submission, I, I, I there, there are limits, of course, uh, that wives are, uh, uh, when Paul says, it, uh, wives submit your own husbands as to the Lord or in the Lord. And that language, I think, communicates, hey, if, so, if your husband commands you to do something completely, obviously wicked, you don't do it. Um, but here in that situation, I would say this is one of those, what you might call a close call. Mm-hmm. It's not clear whether or not the right thing. And I think it, in hindsight, we can see Abraham did wrong, mm-hmm. but in that moment she was like, man, this guy, I don't know if this feels right, but you know, he is my husband. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do what he says mm-hmm. and I'm going to leave that in his hands. Mm-hmm. And do you see, would you agree, uh, the power that that actually has in reducing fear? Absolutely. Because it seems to me that you can be afraid that your husband's going to lead you in the wrong way. And by the way, he will, and I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you can be, but, it, but you can be, have that fear and know that God is in control mm-hmm. and he's uh, safe. Or you can be afraid that, hey, when God said, submit to that man, I'm afraid God didn't know what he was saying. Well, another point that we see is the adornment of her praising Abraham and honoring and submission to him is her adornment. It's not the braided hair and the jewelry. Yes, which it's we talked about submission. last time on the submission. Right. And by the way, let me just say this. But that's a beauty. And yes. what I'm saying is that adorns women to trust their husbands. And it teaches other wives to recognize their husband is flawed, but God above that husband is who put that man in his place. And who's perfect, And yes. you're honoring that. Well, and let me just say this, that uh, I, I like the way you're addressing this and looking at this because it's been my own experience with you, that it's true that uh, you don't every day uh, say, what would you like for supper tonight, Lord? Or uh, do you know where you put the remote, Lord? <laughs> would you rather hear Lord or honey? Uh, or baby. Yes, to, yes, know. absolutely. Yeah. But what you do do is so regularly go out publicly mm. and bring honor to me. You, you're, you're faithful in going on the social media and, and, and lifting me up mm-hmm. and encouraging me there in front of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that builds me up. And, of course, uh, those other uh, terms of endearment uh, likewise, build me up. You know, it just makes me <laughs> melt into a puddle. Mm. Uh, but it does remind us that, doesn't it? Uh, you know, well, how do I put this? Um, there's a propensity in our day to act like our habits, our physical stuff, doesn't really matter. It's just the heart. So when we go to church, it doesn't matter what I look like, it matters where my heart is. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how, how I speak to you. What matters is how I feel about you. That's God draws a connection, and He does so right here in this very text. 
Her submission is connected to her calling right. him Lord. Right. And, and let me say this as going back to what you just referenced, how we dress does speak about our heart. Yes. Yeah, if we connection. want to look sexy, we're going to dress that way. And the Bible, there's some translations, and I was looking back at this, like going backward to that context was, it's not just modest, it's discreet. Yes. It's not trying to lure another man. Yes. And women, I think there's a, uh, probably depending on your age and your level of maturity, there is something within a woman that likes to lure a man if whether she's married or not right if she thinks oh he must be pleasing to me uh, or he must be pleased must by find me. me pleasing yeah. yes mm -hmm. and so i am saying that the more pleasing thing is for her to honor her husband not just in her word or not to even use it to lure another man mm -hmm. because we can talk about that level of wickedness as well mm -hmm. you know it's not a one and done kind of thing right but for all godly women you honor your husband, and you let the world see you honor him. That's what the Proverbs 31 woman does. Amen. And he trusts her. Oh, he does with all his heart. Yeah. As I trust you, sweetheart. And I trust our listeners will want to come back next week. Good to be back. As, as we continue it? our way through this text. I love you, sweetheart. I love you. It is perhaps one of the most common examples of what is called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias suggests that when a person looks at a bit of data, some evidence of something, uh, that person is already prone to interpreting that data in light of what they already believe. It makes for a very difficult time trying to change uh, other people's minds or having our own minds changed when they need to be changed. And that example that I would argue uh, fits today is the absolute hypocrisy on both sides of the aisle politically with respect to the actual powers of the president. If you recall, and this has been pointed out by others as well, it's a pretty obvious faux pas and a long list of faux pas from the commander in chief who seems to be the uh, grandson of Mrs. Malaprop, <laughs> that uh, President Biden, uh, when gas prices began to go up under his uh, leadership or under his presidency, uh, took to uh, blaming essentially the war in Ukraine, calling it Putin's uh, tax hike, and very straightforwardly and publicly making the case that, you know, the president doesn't establish the price of gas. And uh, in many ways, he doesn't have a great deal of authority to have any influence on it. Now, that said, and, and, and by the way, I agree with that premise. I don't care who's in the office of presidency. Uh, prices are not set by fiat from the president or any other politician. And when they are, that's not good. That said, uh, there are policies which uh, encourage uh, the price of gas to go down and policies that encourage the price of gas to go up. That is, uh, when you subsidize something, you get more of it. When you tax something, you get less of it. That's just common sense. And when the president determined that uh, he wanted to see the uh, pipeline uh, that was between Mexico and Canada shut down and close out leases for pumping gas. I mean, the man ran a campaign in which he uh, promised to get us off of gasoline uh, use, not gasoline dependence on foreigners, but gasoline use. We've got to stop using fossil fuels. So he say, hey, I got nothing to do with this, even though he did have a lot to do with it. Uh, not the least of which also should, needs to be mentioned, which is inflation. Inflation, as we've talked about in the past, is uh, not rising prices, but rather the increase in the money supply, which happens when the president uh, asks for and receives uh, money that's not budgeted and not accounted for in terms of taxation when he borrows and, and prints the money. 
uh, that's going to create inflation. That's going to make prices go up. So he starts with, hey, it's not my fault. It's out of my control. And there's some, some truth to it, some falsehood to it. Now, as gas prices have gone down, not from where they were when he came into office, but from where they were at his peak when he was in office, he's taking credit. He's taking, he's not saying, now look, I know your guys are relieved to see the price of gas come down, but really that has nothing to do with me because I'm just the president. No, he didn't do that. He's taking credit publicly. Well, this, friends, is not a Democrat problem. This is a politician problem. Politicians want to persuade voters that they are not responsible for bad things that happen and that they are responsible for good things that happen. And by the way, you don't even have to be a politician to be prone to that. In the uh, business realm, you'll often see uh, folks arguing, oh, the reason our sales went down had nothing to do with me. It was outside of my control. Or the reason sales went up is because I'm such the greatest salesman the world's ever seen. Well, typically, cause and effect is a little bit more complicated than that. Not, I'm not saying there are no causes and no effects. Obviously, there are. But... Again, I would just like to encourage us on all sides of the fence to be a little bit more humble. The truth is, we don't always know all the things that are going to have an impact on something. We do know foundational principles, as I said. Uh, subsidize something, you'll get more of it. Tax something, you'll get less of it. We do know that uh, increasing supply will decrease uh, prices. Uh, increasing demand and no increase in supply will increase prices. These are foundational economic principles. And we would be wise to have them so that we would not be led by the nose by politicians who so blatantly lie to us, so straightforwardly uh, display their hypocrisy with the utmost confidence that we won't notice. We need to notice whoever's in office. We ought to experience a kind of potent emotional whiplash or uh, even the earth moving under our feet when we turn the page as we read our Bibles from Genesis 2 to Genesis chapter 3. For two chapters, the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recounts for us the glory of God and the creation of the universe and the creation of the garden and the creation of man and the creation of woman. And just everything is made. Everything there is what we were made for. It's that which should strike in us a deep sense of longing We've got to get back to the garden. But when you turn the page to chapter 3, the first thing we read is, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field. I think it's interesting that uh, God has determined not only to not uh, communicate to us via what would make sense to us, which would be a kind of systematic theology where he handles uh, what he knows to be true of this doctrine followed by that doctrine followed by the other doctrine, but instead begins with the story of creation and continues in that kind of story mode all the way through uh, the Pentateuch. But what's interesting to me is that the story doesn't really begin in the beginning. Or if it does, then it might. Let me just uh, give my a caveat to what I'm saying. We don't know when the things that I'm about to mention happened and whether this in the beginning is uh, the beginning of time or whether it's the beginning of the created order. Because sometime uh, between when there was God and nothing else and when there was Adam and Eve in the garden, at some time in between there, we had a rebellion from the serpent 
in which he persuaded a third of the de- uh, angels who became demons to come with him in this rebellion. For all the good and the glory and the wonder that is described in chapters 1 and 2, it's not a, what's the word for it, a pristine and unblemished reality. Because existing in that world, at least by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, we have uh, the morning star having uh, Lucifer having revolted against God and again leading a third of the angels uh, with him. It's a, oh gosh, what's the word for it? Um, Well, as I said, it should cause a kind of emotional whiplash because this is bad news. Now, we live on the other side of this event, and so we should know what's coming. But I think we, 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 I don't know, we just don't take it seriously enough. This is one of those places where I like to just stop and say, hey, we need to remember that this is true. That Adam and Eve were real human beings, just like you and I, except without sin. That the serpent was really a serpent. And the conversation actually happened. The sin actually happened. The fall actually happened. Unbelievably massive shift and change in the story. In fact, it's the kind of thing that should just lead you to basically have utter despair, utter and complete loss of any hope, except for the fact that God does come into the garden and reveal the promise of his grace and the success of the second Adam and the destruction of the serpent. We're going to take a closer look at that uh, in the next week. But for now, I want us to, I, I, I almost want to encourage you to just hang on to that sense of foreboding, that sense of uh, uh, fear and terror uh, that comes as we sort of enter into the story as newbies. Uh, and then we'll see where it goes from there next time. The last time we were together in our good news segment, we looked at some uh, hard words that John the Baptist uh, had for the scribes and the Pharisees who came to Uh, find out what they could about him and his baptism. And today uh, we turn to another encounter of John the Baptist, this time not with the scribes and the Pharisees, but with Jesus. I mentioned last time it's important to have some recognition of the uh, size and the scope of the ministry of John, that he was wildly uh, popular among the citizens in and around uh, Jerusalem, but he was also profoundly and acutely aware of his role, that he was not the one uh, that everyone should be looking for and waiting for, but rather he was a herald uh, or a forerunner. So now we come uh, in Matthew chapter 3 to uh, the, the coming together of the herald and the one who's being heralded. And it comes with a great surprise to John because Jesus comes seeking to be baptized by John. And John's sort of in a a sticky situation here. Uh, His response is, on the one hand, uh, good and honorable. On the other hand, not so good and honorable. This is what he says. John says to Jesus, he says, well, actually, Matthew says in verse 14, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? Well, it might have been, uh, he might have got straight A's across the board if instead he had said, Please, Jesus, help me understand why I would baptize you rather than you baptize me. But but when you begin to try to prevent the Lord God uh, in the flesh from doing what he wills to do, that's not a great place to be. Uh, So he shouldn't have tried to prevent it. He understandably didn't understand it and rightfully understood that if we view baptism as 
in a sense, the more spiritually mature, uh, bringing in uh, the less spiritually mature, then surely John should be baptized by Jesus. But Jesus, even though John didn't, uh, I don't know, as early as he should have, Jesus gave him a good answer. Jesus says, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting, this is verse 15, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And from there, John baptizes Jesus. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Well, what's all that about? Well, if you remember when we started considering John and his baptism, we talked about the very surprising nature, the connection between John's baptism and uh, the ceremonial washing and cleansing of those who were converted to Judaism uh, at this time. And it was a Gentile who had to be washed before he could be welcomed into God's covenant people. And now here's John saying to God's covenant people, you need to be washed. Well, does Jesus need to be washed? Well, no, he doesn't because he's clean. It's not necessary for him to be washed, which is precisely what John is saying. But Jesus kind of turns the question or the uncertainty on its head by saying it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Look, John. You're absolutely right. I'm not dirty. I don't need to be washed. But the reason I'm not dirty, John, is because I obey my heavenly father. And my heavenly father has called those who call upon his name to be baptized by you. So even though that which is represented in this baptism does not apply specifically to me, What does apply to me is that I am commanded to obey whatever my father commands, not just me, but any of sinful humanity. Are you tracking here? What we have here is Jesus being scrupulous in his obedience to the law of God. I think based on this text, I don't know that we have another text that that uh, speaks specifically to this, but based on this text, I think it's safe to assume that uh, Jesus would bring sacrifices to the temple that were required in the law of God, even though those sacrifices are required or were created for the sake of sinners. And Jesus is not a sinner. Jesus, we know, celebrated the Passover. Well, the (laughs) Jesus does not need to be passed over because he is innocent in himself. In fact, because he is the Passover lamb. So this is one of those places where uh, there's a historical account. There's something a little bit odd about it. And boy, it's really fruitful to slow down, take a look and consider what it might mean. And I think that Matthew knew precisely that when he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, determined to share this with us. Though I didn't think that such a thing was possible My esteem for both my father and the Bible took a rather sudden spike. I was blessed to be sitting in a seminary class while he stood teaching. He mentioned almost in passing this notion that rocked my world. Some scholars, he said, and by the way he said it, I had a strong suspicion that he was one of those scholars believe that the, quote, man Joshua met outside the wall of Jericho was a pre-incarnate manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, a Christophany. I was blown away as he went on to make the case. He encouraged us to remember that Joshua bowed and worshipped. Had that man been a mere angel from God, the angel would have forbidden such worship. That the being received the worship made the case. That the father would send the son further sanctified this already holy moment as Joshua prepares for the first battle for the promised land. Better still, however, was the conversation itself. Joshua, you'll remember, had 
uh, only recently replaced Moses as the leader of God's people. The wandering in the desert wilderness for 40 years has come to an end. The Jordan has been crossed. And now, between God's people and the land stands Jericho and its seemingly impenetrable walls. If you were Joshua, wouldn't you be frightened, confused? Would you not feel the weight of every brick in that wall on your own back as you take up the mantle of leadership? In the midst of this turmoil, Joshua finds himself facing a man. Joshua neither rashly attacks nor shrinks back. Instead, he asks what seems to us an utterly fitting question. Are you for us or for our adversaries? God the Son had not come, however, merely to honor the occasion. Neither was his goal merely to bring the victory. Instead, he came to sanctify Joshua, to give Joshua the right perspective. To his, that is, Joshua's either or, God the Son replies, no. Just as Jesus would befuddle the Pharisees as they sought to trap him with their questions, here he befuddles us. No? What does that mean? Jesus continues, But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. He explains to Joshua this most fundamental truth. The question, Joshua, is not whether or not I'm on your side or theirs. The question is whether or not you are on my side. Whether at war or at peace, in want or in plenty, whatever our circumstances, this is the same question we all face every day. Indeed, when Jesus spoke from the mount, he made much the same point. He did so because we, like Joshua, need to learn the same point. Like Joshua before us, we look at our obstacles in fear and confusion. Will we be able to win this struggle at work? Will we be able to tame this challenge in our homes? Will we be able to overcome this obstacle at our church? And in our prayer lives... As we meet with our Father through God the Son, we ask sometimes in hope, other times in despair, if he is with us, if he will come to our aid and win the battle for us. And in his grace and terrible sovereign power and authority, he tells us, no. Friends, God is not a witness to history, choosing sides and cheering his favorites on. God is the Lord of history, moving history forward as what it is, his story. God's grace to us isn't that he sides with us, but that he has put enmity in our hearts against the serpent and his seed. God's grace isn't that he fights for us, but that he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, gives us life so that we might fight for him. When Jesus tells us to stop worrying about what we will eat and what we will wear, reminding us that the Gentiles worry about such things, he naturally reasons in the same manner. His message isn't, hey, don't sweat it, God is for you. He'll come to your aid to make sure you get what you want. God is on your side. Instead, the command is not to worry about these things, our own interests and agendas, because we are called to passionately pursue the interests and agenda of the kingdom of God. He tells us, no, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The truth wisdom, 
the word. He does not change, and neither does his message to us. What he spoke to Joshua, he speaks to us. Christ speaks the same message in both the Old and New Testaments because he is speaking to the same people. Those who by faith are his. That he is captain of the army of the Lord is grace to Joshua and grace to us, because by the same grace we are made soldiers in that army. The same grace in turn is what ensures the victory. He is our captain. He, not Joshua, brings down the walls of Jericho. He, not Joshua, brings his people into the land of promise. He, not Joshua, storms the very gates of hell. He, not Joshua, takes captivity captive. He, not Joshua, is Lord of lords and King of kings. And we, because he loves us, march in the victory parade with him. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsporjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.